please take your seats and welcome our MC, Michael Weiss. Hey. Good morning, everyone. How you guys doing? Nice. Well, welcome back this morning, and uh, I hope everybody had a great time last night. I, I know that I did. It was, uh, it was a wonderful night of uh, connecting and reconnecting with each other. And, and speaking of connecting and reconnecting, I just wanted to remind everybody that you can uh, easily get the app for the conference if you text just the word app, APP to 877-877, and you'll be able to follow all the, uh, the tweets and uh, get all the information for the conference schedule. Um, I know when I announced my, uh, my Twitter address last night, I got a ton of new followers, so thank you. And I was also asked by a lot of people if I brought a card with me. I didn't. But if you go to mymsteam.com, all my contact information is there. So send me an email, follow me on Twitter, and I'll, I'll get back to you. And, and anyway, I mean, that, that's really what this whole conference and the MS movement is about, is, is each one of us, you know, as a part of, of something even greater. And it doesn't matter whether we're connected by a handshake, Twitter, Bike MS Ride, World Wide Web, Facebook, whatever it is, we're collectively the heartbeat of this movement. So let, let's take a few minutes and hear from an individual who took action first by sharing her story online and then providing a way for others to share their stories. Please help me welcome Lauren Hansen. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone. It's such an honor to be here in front of you today. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis six years ago. And at the time, I knew nothing about the disease, and I certainly didn't know anyone my age that had it. And while learning about MS was easy, meeting others my age wasn't. So I contacted my chapter, the Michigan chapter, and together <laughs> we launched a new self-help group, MS Transitions, for people in their 20s and 30s living with MS. That first time that I met another 20-something living with multiple sclerosis and heard her say, I understand what you're going through. And know that for once, somebody truly did was amazing. I knew then that I couldn't keep quiet anymore about my diagnosis. I wanted to provide others with the chance to have that moment of connection and to use my story to raise awareness of what so many people live with every day. And so I started talking. I posted stories online and reached out to anyone who would listen. I said yes any time the MS Society asked me to host a program or do a speaking engagement. I interviewed with the MS Society magazine Momentum and even went back to school to get my master's in public health to become a better health educator and advocate. Anything that would help get the word out, I did. And in this way, our little self-help group started to grow. People started to come out of the woodwork, and it seemed as if everyone knew someone with MS. A friend that I had not seen since high school messaged me on Facebook and said that her friend was newly diagnosed. She had seen my posts about MS and thought to contact me for help. Soon I was getting requests from all over the state for people to join our group. And so I created a private online community on Facebook to allow for participation for people living far away or for increased communication in between meetings. And as the word got out, others interested in starting similar groups contacted me. I shared any insight I had to help in the creation of such groups countrywide. And while much of what I do these days for the movement is online or nationwide, I experienced firsthand just last month how everything we do has a real impact at home. I was getting breakfast with a friend at a, a local place it's really tiny, so seats may be 30, so you end up having to share tables with strangers. And we were seated with these two young women, and they asked, of course, like people do, what I did for a living. And I mentioned my music, sure, but what I talked about most was my work and interest with multiple sclerosis. The woman across from me brightened and said, my sister has MS. She just moved to town and doesn't know anyone. So I told her about MS transitions, and I gave her my card. And the very next day, I received an email from the sister. I told her that we had just had our monthly meeting, but in the meantime, she was welcome to join our online community and meet the others. Not only did she join,
but thanks to the group input, she found a local neurologist and even got a group member to come with her to her first appointment because she was nervous about seeing the new neurologist. All of this took place online, sight unseen. She found friends. And what I take from all of this is that it doesn't matter how we reach out, just that we do. Take the time to talk about multiple sclerosis in this society and talk often. You never know who you might reach and what that connection can do. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was, uh, that was a great story. And, and it, it, it still amazes me how enriched our lives are by connecting with each other. Um, you know, and, and how the web can, can sometimes be just the right tool for those connections. This morning, we're going to learn more uh, about what it means to be on the front lines. And here to get us started is the Society's Executive Vice President of Marketing and Development, Graham McReynolds. Thanks, Michael. Isn't he great? And um, I just have to give him some props because um, he also just agreed to be the, for our strategic response, our, the co-lead with me on the fundraising goal team. So in addition to this, you know, we're roping him in a little more. So thanks, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Um, five years ago, the National MS Society launched a new organizational brand thanks to the immense talent and the generosity of the friends, our friends at Widening Kennedy. This new brand brought the MS movement to life, capturing the spirit, the hope, the optimism, and the determination that each of us have in reaching a world free of MS. Their work was a tremendous gift, and all of you work so hard to put it to its best use. And so I'd like to take a moment and talk about how powerful our awareness efforts have been, because it's been the most successful awareness campaign in our history. You may not know, but for the past three years, we've received the Golden Thinker Award, and that's an honor for achieving the most print and broadcast placements in North America. Three years and running. We've had ads in the New York Times, USA Today, People, Sports Illustrated, and hey, even the National Enquirer. So just to name a few. And we've been splashed on 10-story video screens wrapping Times Square and on the jumbotron outside Super Bowl. So whether it's been in your neighborhood or it's been on the network news, every one of you has taken MS awareness personally. Thank you. MS is also personal at Wyden and Kennedy, and it's at the core of this continued partnership. So I'd like you all to take a moment and get to know Dan Wyden, the leader at Wyden and Kennedy, and his daughter Laura, so you can hear what drives their dedication to this cause. What should the whole world know about MS? Um, that it's not the same for everyone? It's very different? I would say also that uh, being diagnosed with MS does not mean you're no longer a player. Mm. It mm -hmm. means you're just playing from a different angle. Yeah. I'm Laura Wyden. And I'm Dan Wyden. Laura is beautiful. Laura is a tower of strength. Laura has the biggest heart I know of. Three adjectives to describe my father. Um, handsome and uh, generous and very loving and supportive. How about four? As a family, we've always been uh, less about um, presentation or appearance or stuff like that and 
We've always been dealing with things pretty straightforwardly and openly. It is raw in the best sense of the word. Because of my MS, it's kept us much more connected because of projects and things that we do. Just because I have it, I happen, my dad happens to be in advertising that happens to do this, that, and it just, the ball keeps going. People will always come together and blow apart and come together and blow apart, and maybe by inches or miles or whatever. But one of the things I, that it's the, to me anyway, the law of the land is you do not let go. You let mm -hmm. people have the freedom they need when they need it, but you don't let go and you stay in touch. And um, that's how you can actually make a difference. Everyone knows someone with MS. That was my big um, um, eye-opener, was that everyone knows somebody mm. with MS. When somebody else does come out and say, oh, wow, my aunt or, uh, or my uncle or my sister has MS as well, there's a sympathy, an opening up, so that that connection is not just um, mm -hmm. a functional thing. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very deep, immediate connection that, wow, we all belong to a very serious club. People start talking about it and trying and coming together as a community to um, not just raise money for it, but to become active and helping those people because we're all part of it, you know? Every, just because I have MS, my whole family has MS. And I think it's a bigger, it's a huge family. If you count everyone affected. I love this woman. <laughs> As you can see, Dan and Laura and our team from Widening Kennedy share our determination in doing everything necessary to reach a world free of MS. And to achieve our goal, our work with awareness, understanding, and engagement must expand exponentially. We know that attracting and engaging people in the MS movement requires us all to be on the front lines with relevant messaging and compelling opportunities to take action. And there's just simply no one better than Widening Kennedy to help us do that. Widening Kennedy is one of the world's leading agency, building such iconic brands as Target, Levi's, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, Nike. You may have heard of a few of those. And they are perhaps the most, most awarded agency around Last year's industry analyst, Creativity, and Adweek named them Agency of the Year. Over the past several months, Wyden and Kennedy has helped work to evolve our current messaging, even to an even more powerful campaign, one in which we take our attitude up to the next level, letting us become more effective in our efforts together. And did I mention that this work is pro bono? Like many of us, like many of us, Wyden and Kennedy's involvement started with a single connection, and it just speaks to the incredible power of each person's personal ability to connect. How one person, Laura Wyden, figured out what she needs and what she has to give and how that evolves to something so much bigger, bringing her family and widening Kennedy to the movement. One person willing to go to the front lines and all the things that can come together as a result. So it's now my pleasure to introduce you to the widening Kennedy team. Today, they're gonna share their journey, what they learned from us, and more importantly, what they learned from people living with MS and from where we can go from here. So please join me in welcoming our Widening Kennedy team, Andy Lindblade, Don Shelford, Jay Smith, Max Erdenberger, and Corey Woodson. Thanks, man. Go ahead, we'll sit behind. So uh, first of all, thanks for having us here today. Uh, it's an honor for us at uh, Widen and Kennedy to work with everyone at the National MS Society, and that, of course, includes all of you. Um, we first worked with you all several years ago, and uh, we're thrilled to be developing a new campaign for the, for the National MS Society. Um, I think it's 
When we, you know, it's, it was interesting for us to start work on this assignment, and when we did start work on it some months ago, we rolled up our sleeves and went right back to where and when the society really started in New York City back in 1945. Uh, the reason we did this was because we wanted to understand the original source of energy and drive that would eventually become the society as it stands today. Many of you may recognize this ad. It was placed in the New York Times in 1945, and the writer was clearly seeking a connection with people who had experience and knowledge with multiple sclerosis. What stood out to us about this ad was a strong sense of motivation, conviction, and energy, a desire to make something happen, and thus a refusal to remain isolated. Sylvia Laurie was the first activist who was at the front lines of MS. Her energy and determination led to the founding of the National MS Society and all that it has done for people who have and are living with MS. And now, after talking to many people with MS as part of this assignment, as well as people who volunteer at the society, who work at the society, we understood and really felt that everyone has a sense of urgency and motivation to live better lives with MS and to simply know more and to simply be more engaged, to feel more connected just like Sylvia Laurie must have felt when she placed that ad in the New York Times some 60-odd years ago. In short, we're all Sylvia Laurie's of our time. We are all activists. We all have that same sense of energy and conviction. We all have the motivation, the potential, and the expectation that there are better methods and solutions for living with MS. And we all believe that with enough drive, enough collective effort, we can ultimately end MS forever. As we know, MS can be an incredibly isolating disease. But if we could all somehow connect with each other in new, easier, and more effective ways, then suddenly the potential to move forward, both individually and collectively, will become far stronger. Since we made the Join the Movement campaign together some years ago, there have been profound changes in how all of us get our information about what's happening in the world at large, and also within the communities that we're part of. Also, the ways and means of communicating have profoundly changed. So now, in this new era of communication and connectivity, all of us can be better informed about the latest developments in the journey for better MS treatments, the latest cutting-edge research, and how we can be more effective together. The collective knowledge and experience of all of us is a powerful thing. Not only does it mean that each of us can potentially find ideas, facts, or insights that can help us lead better lives, but it means that the society itself can become a more robust organization. The MS Society's role is to help move everyone connected to MS, whether a person living with MS, a family member of someone with MS, a researcher, a healthcare professional, a volunteer, a fundraiser, whoever. Our job is to move them to the front lines of better treatments and the quest to end MS. The campaign we're about to share with you shows how we're articulating and expressing this strategic approach. In short, the whole of the National MS Society will always be stronger than the sum of its parts. And this is why each of us, people with MS, volunteers, fundraisers, researchers, clini uh, clinicians, society staff, can play a role in the future. We can all connect to play a role in the future. Sylvia Laurie showed us the power and optimism of connecting with others over 65 years ago. It's now up to each of us to continue the journey. Thank you for having us here today, and we sincerely hope you like the campaign. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Um, just so you know, our, our, we had requested that our walk-on song be It's Raining Men, but uh, <laughs> didn't... Uh, Graham's better judgment made that not happen. But, uh, but uh, thank you so much again uh, for, having us, for having us here. We're really excited to show you the work we, we have. Um, before we get into it, I just want to quickly introduce the team back here. Um, so you've met Andy. Um, this is Jay, our copywriter. And yeah, I know what you're thinking. We have the same hairdresser. So <laughs> that's that question. This is Max, our art director. And Corey, our account supervisor. Um, so that's a team that's been working on this for the past uh, few months tirelessly. Um, so we have a bunch of stuff we really want to show you. We have some print and uh, some magazine and some newspaper and a lot of outdoor and TV and uh, just a load of work. Um, but the first thing I'd really like to start with um, 
would be a, a short video that we think does a really great job capturing the spirit of what this campaign is all about. So we'll just start with that first and then we'll kind of move on from there. MS is trying to shut people down. That's what it does. It disrupts signals, divides minds from bodies, pulls us from our lives and away from each other. MS is a destroyer of connection, so it's only fitting that connection would be its greatest enemy. So what if we were able to connect everyone who had MS, or treated MS, or researched MS in one place? What if that place made it easy to see and share everything everyone knew, every feeling, idea, and experience, and all of it became searchable and shareable and cross-referenceable? Because who knows, maybe the answers are out there already, in a blog post, or a tweet, or a YouTube video. Maybe we just need the right people to see them and put them together and then the connections they make become more powerful than the connections MS destroys. MS kills connection. Connection kills MS. Thanks. So that's our first piece. Um, as you can see, the idea here is all about creating connections. Um, and whether those connections be Small connections, um, something as simple as a blog post or, or a simple tweet that only one person reads, or um, much bigger connections like all of you here in this room together, um, hundreds of you here, and a dog that I see up front. Um, uh, much bigger connections, uh, both of those are equally as important, and um, either one of those, no matter how small or how big, can have a huge impact on someone's life. So, this campaign um, just tells the story of, uh, or two sides of, of the story of, about connections and, and, what, and how these little or big connections can affect people. So the first piece we'll look at is a, is a newspaper, uh, newspaper ad. And Jay can kind of read you through this. So you've probably been seeing these lines around. And in this newspaper ad, we're using these lines to tell two sides of one story. So the top part kind of tells the intro and the bottom connects to how that affected someone. So this first one says, a guy in North Carolina wonders if he's the only one experiencing vertigo when he walks around the block. And we follow that to read, 30 people reassure him that this is normal and one suggests a remedy she tried. So there's a very simple uh, connection line that you'll start to see uh, throughout this campaign to illustrate that. Uh, here's a magazine. Um, this one reads, a man in Arizona clicked share on an article on how to keep health insurance coverage. And that connects to, it stops a woman in New Hampshire from losing her health insurance, which means she can afford the daily medication she needs. And then this next is a billboard that reads, a boy in Minnesota shares how he's feeling. And that connects to, it stops a guy in Oregon who's lost his job and his girlfriend from wanting to give up. So we love playing with this connection line device, and uh, we think where it starts to really get fun is once we start breaking out of um, these, the, the page, if you will. So like this is um, an example of like posters that would be up in New York, and actually painting the connection line on multiple posters and connecting to multiple stories, so having more points along the story. Um, and just to note too, these stories um, are things that we've pulled from from tweets and from groups um, and just stories that we've been told. Um, and the portraits will be uh, portraits of, of people in the society. Um, and this is another example of kind of breaking out of the traditional frame. So this would be um, two sequential uh, pictures in a bus stop and actually connecting the line across the two pictures. Yeah, this is, this is when the campaign becomes uh, really interesting and, and the line works wonderfully is when the media become more separated, it actually illustrates the idea and becomes even stronger uh, to show how that connection can happen across things that uh, wouldn't have connected before. Yeah. Um, and then like, we, we also really liked painting that line across a building. So two billboards on a, either side of a building and just showing how that line can connect across space. Don't tell the landlord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, even if the building, even if it wasn't on the same building, two buildings on either side of a road and actually painting the line all the way across a bridge or road to really show how distance doesn't matter. Yeah, you can, you can have a lot of fun with it. So this is, and the next example is another even, uh, taking it even further. Yeah. 
So this, is, this was kind of playing with like an optical illusion. So if you stand on this orange spot, the two billboards would line up perfectly, creating that connection line and, and turning two things that were completely different spaces into one ad. Blowing your minds right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, it, and it also is so simple and graphic that it works really well as um, just a simple graphic on the internet. So for like a banner ad or something, you can actually have a banner that follows that line. And um, we also like the, how live the conversation is that's happening out there. It's not a stagnant co community. There's always something changing and always something happening online. So this w was an idea of just taking conversations that happened in the past 24 hours and just painting them on a wall. So every 24 hours, it's, it's something that someone said. And doing this in a place where a lot of people walk by, so you really get a sense of how quick things are changing. And as you paint over it, you can still see a little bit of the uh, previous conversations underneath, but it just really speaks to how live and how active um, everyone that's part of this movement is. And then this is just something that we thought was super fun was, um, just taking elevator but an elevator button and connecting them, and you can tell a little story that way. It can even be a story of like something that happened in the building of, oh, I didn't realize that someone else in the building shared this connection. They were on the second floor and I was on the fifth floor. So um, we just we just love playing with these little connection lines anywhere we can. Yeah. So so hopefully uh, these are some examples that you can start to see how this works and and the kind of legs it has, as you say. Um, so the uh, the final thing we'd like to show you is is a rough cut of our TV spot. And um, it takes a, a different visual approach than the first one you saw, which was more animated. Um, and we spent quite a while in Los Angeles filming people down there and gathering stories about connections um, with some of the people in, in the Los Angeles area. And we used this line again, as well as uh, the idea of split screens to kind of uh, connect uh, two people that are sometimes in two different locations or people that um, have connected online. So you can roll that film. MS destroys connections inside of us, disconnects the mind from the body and people from each other. But what if the connections started fighting back and found new ways around the disease? And every person and doctor and researcher could join together in defiance of MS. What if we could conquer a disease with each other? MS kills connection. Connection kills MS. So, uh, so that's our, uh, you probably recognize the voice on that. Limited, limitless <laughs> talent, I guess, limitless. But, um, but uh, that's really it, so thank you guys so much, um, and I hope you enjoy the work, we're really excited about it, and I hope you, uh, you are too. Thank you. All right, that way. The future is what it used to be. Thank you, Andy, Don, Jay, Max, and Corey. Um, the other piece I just want to touch on that they didn't talk about is that all of this work is also going to drive to a brand new online community uh, that we've been creating in partnership with Wyden Kennedy. So we have seen some, some of the rough draft. We want to give you the sneak preview and show you this. The other piece that we've been working on in partnership with them and all of their contacts in the online world, Google, Facebook, all the people who they work with, is to have all this drive to a new community site that will allow people to search and find and connect in completely new and different ways. Um, so we're excited about that work and, and where all this goes. It, it really does allow us to connect in these incredibly powerful ways using sort of what the best of the world has to offer and our friends at Wyden Kennedy helping make that a reality. We believe so much in this campaign that it is authentic, that it's real. Um, it's a powerful campaign that we each can personally move th forward through our connections and actions. So I know you're all wondering, at least I know all the staff are wondering, when will I get my hands on these? And what I can tell you is that this campaign will be launched during MS Awareness Week in March. 
So you need to hang tight till then because we want you to have a sneak preview of where we're going with the work. Um, but we do have something for you today um, because you can't leave any society event without a new t-shirt to add to your collection. Um, come on up. So we have Carrie and Elisa. <laughs> So, <laughs> thank you very much. So, you're going to get to pick up your, your Connection t-shirt right after our lunch out in the exhibit hall uh, later this afternoon. So, uh, make sure you go to the exhibit hall and check those out. Um, you know, we really are talking about changing the world, having an impact, making our difference, moving to the front lines. MS Kills Connection, Connection kills MS. This attitude has to fuel our actions every day. And we all know this is hard work um, that we all have to do to change the world for people affected by MS. Today we're going to hear more about how attitude moves us to the front lines. And not just attitude, but positive attitude that way makes our work fulfilling and brings joy to our life, even when the going gets tough. Our keynote speaker this morning, Sean Aker, is an expert in the field of positive psychology. He's going to share with us the importance of a positive attitude and how it can sustain each of us at the front lines of the MS movement. Sean's research and lecture on happiness and human potential have received attention in numerous places, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and even last week, some of you may have seen a big article in the Wall Street Journal. Sean graduated from Harvard with honors and lived in Harvard Yard uh, counseling students for seven years, helping them with the, the stresses of the first year. And this helped lay the basis for his work on positive psychology. Today, Sean travels around the world helping corporations, schools, and nonprofit organizations apply the power of positive psychology, helping each of us understand where human potential, success, and happiness intersect. We're so delighted to have Sean with us today to talk about how we as leaders can continue to increase happiness and meaning in our work, and as a result, achieve more. Please help me welcome Sean Acor. Good morning, everyone. I am so honored and thrilled to get this opportunity to speak with you. I've spoken to so many people this morning that thank me for coming in and speaking, but honestly, it's my honor, partly because I know that the average academic scientific journal article is only read by seven people total, <laughs> which is extraordinarily depressing for a researcher, because I know that, that statistic also includes my mom. So. We have to be honest that uh, most of our research articles are only read by six people, which means this extraordinary gap exists between what we've been learning in the field of positive psychology and about how the human brain works and what gets out to the people who are trying to lead extraordinary movements, what's out on the front lines. So what I'd like to talk about today is to bring that research to you and to show the connections between not only that field, but the work and the, the hope that you have on a daily basis. So many of you have heard me before at an e-university, and I started that with a story I'd like to start with today, which is how I got into this movement of positive psychology. I started uh, this research when I was seven years old. If you uh, have children who are seven years old and they're not doing scientific research, you're clearly not a tiger parent pushing your kids as hard as possible. But I was seven years old and my sister was five years old, so she was two years younger than me at the time. Um, she's two years younger than me now. Um, but at that time, that meant she had to do everything that I wanted to do. And I wanted to play war. So we were up on top of my bunk beds. And on one side of my bunk bed, on, I had all my G.I. Joe soldiers and weaponry lined up. And on her side of her bed, she had all of her, I don't know, My Little Ponies and unicorns. And I wasn't too concerned about what was going to happen. I had won this war several times in the past. But there are differing accounts of what did happen. But since my sister was not invited here to speak, you're going to get to hear the true story, <laughs> which is my sister is a little bit on the clumsy side. 
And somehow, without any help or push from her loving older brother at all, suddenly Amy disappeared off of the top of the bunk bed and landed with this crash on the floor. And I nervously peered over the side of the bed to see what had befallen my fallen sister and saw that she had landed, landed painfully on her hands and knees on all fours on the ground. Now I was nervous because my parents had charged me with making sure that my sister and I played as safely and as quietly as possible. And seeing as how I had accidentally broken Amy's arm <laughs> just one week before, <laughs> heroically pushing her out of the way of an oncoming imaginary sniper bullet, <laughs> for which I have yet to be thanked. She didn't even see it coming. I was trying as hard as I could to be on my best behavior, and I saw in my sister's face this wail of pain and suffering and surprise, threatening to erupt from her mouth and threatening to wake my parents from the long winter's nap for which they had settled. So I did the only thing that my little frantic seven-year-old brain could think to do to avert this tragedy. And if you have children, you've seen this hundreds of times before. I said, Amy, Amy, wait, please, please, please don't cry. Did you see how you landed? No human lands on all fours like that. She stops mid-cry with confusion on her face, and I'm trying to figure out where this is going. And I said, Amy, I think this means you're a unicorn. <laughs> Which was cheating, because there's nothing in the world my sister would want more to not be Amy the hurt five-year-old little sister, but Amy the special unicorn. Of course, this was an option that was open to her brain at no point in the past. And you could see on my poor, manipulated sister's face conflict as her brain attempted to devote resources to feeling the pain and suffering and surprise she was experiencing or contemplating this newfound identity as a unicorn, and of course, the latter won out. Instead of crying, instead of ceasing our play, instead of waking my parents with all the negative consequences that were about to ensue for me, instead a smile spread across her face and she was able to scramble right back up onto the bunk bed with all the grace of a baby unicorn. What we stumbled across at that tender age of five and seven, we had no idea at the time, was something that was going to be at the vanguard, the front line of a scientific revolution occurring two decades later in the way that we study the human brain. What we had stumbled across is the idea that the brain is like a single processor in a computer. Each of our brains has only a limited amount of resources to experiencing the world. So scientifically, happiness is actually a choice a choice about how we unconsciously or consciously choose to devote those finite resources that we have. Are we scanning the world for all the weaknesses we have, the problems, the errors, the stresses, and as a result of that, have no brain left over for seeing the ways that we could be grateful for the present moment, the meaning embedded within our lives and the work you do on a daily basis, and the ways of transforming this present reality into a more positive one. What we had stumbled across was the field of positive psychology, which is a new movement in social psychology which changes how we study humans in an extraordinary way. What we found is, when I first started doing this research, they said, Sean, whatever you do, don't start with a lot of graphs. The very first thing I'm doing <laughs> is starting with a graph, but this graph is the reason that I get excited and wake up every morning, which means I live a, a very exciting life. Um, each of these red dots indicates an individual could be plotting anything here. This graph is even fake. That's why those numbers don't make any sense on the sides. I made this graph up. But this graph actually indicates what positive psychology is. Not that I made up the numbers. What it means is that if I was plotting anything here, age and relationship to height for a child, the, the older a child gets, the taller they get up to a point. That's great. What, what we find is that uh, the fact that there's one weird red dot, by the way, that's up above the curve, that's no problem. That's no problem, as everyone here in this room knows, because I'm just going to delete that dot from my data. <laughs> I'm going to delete that dot because that's clearly a measurement error. And I know that it's an error because it's messing up my data. So one of the very first things that we teach people in economics and statistics and business courses is how, in a valid way, can we eliminate those weirdos in the room? How do we eliminate those people that are messing up my line of best fit, my average? Which is great if I want to find out how many Advil the average person might take or how many aspirin they should take. But if I was uh, interested in a question like potential, we, we're starting to have some problems. Now, by the way, if you fall below average at a company or at a school, then psychologists get thrilled because that means you're either depressed or you have a disorder or hopefully both. <laughs> 
Because oftentimes what we're looking for is we want, if you come into a therapy session with one problem, we hope you leave knowing you have 10 problems so that you'll keep coming back to our therapy sessions because we love talking to you. But part of it, we'll go all the way back into your childhood if necessary. But the goal of traditional psychology is how do we make you normal again? But normal is merely average. What I posit and what positive psychology posits is that if we study what is merely average, we will remain merely average. What I'm interested in is why is it that there are some people that are high above, up above the curve? Why are there people like Lauren and Michael? Why are there people that, like you, who in the midst of all the, the hurry and bustles of life are finding ways to contribute in an extraordinarily powerful way? Because what we do is, instead of deleting those red dots, what we do is we intentionally study them. I'd want to go into a room and find out why is it there are some people in this room that are so extraordinarily resilient compared to the rest of the population, or so extraordinarily positive. Your levels of charisma, your intellectual abilities, your creative abilities, whatever it is that causes you to be above the curve. We study you so that we can glean information, not how we can move people up to the average, but how we can move the entire average up in our companies, in our schools, in our society as a whole. Now, the reason I started with this graph is this is not normally the message that we get. Normally, the message we get, if you turn on the news, for example, oftentimes it's about murder or corruption or diseases or natural disasters or what's going on in Greece. And as a result of that, what happens is our brain starts to think that is the accurate ratio of negative to positive in the world. And as a result of that, it changes us. For those of you who have medical training in here, or those of you who know people in the medical community, of course, you know during the first year of medical training, as, a, as these brilliant and aspiring doctors read through a list of all the symptoms and diseases that could happen to a person, suddenly these doctors start thinking that they have all of those symptoms and diseases, and they start manifesting them. It's what we call the medical school syndrome. I have a brother-in-law named Bobo, which is a whole other story how I let that happen. Bobo married Amy the Unicorn, so Bobo, <laughs> Bobo called me on the phone from Yale Medical School, and he said, Sean, I have, I have leprosy, <laughs> which even at Yale is extraordinarily rare, but I had no idea how to console poor Bobo because he had just gotten over an entire week of menopause. See, what we're finding is it's not necessarily the reality that shapes us, but the lens through which we view the world that shapes our experience of reality. And if we could change the lens through which your brain views the world, not only can we create the type of positive leadership we want, we could raise our health outcomes and ripple this out to the people around us. After that brilliant presentation you had right before mine about the new ad campaign, I'd love to do an experiment that's the science behind that campaign. In order to do that, what I'm going to need you to do, by the way, you don't have to do any of my experiments today. Um, I asked for a whole semester with you guys, and they said, we'll give you a half an hour. <laughs> so we're going to pack a whole bunch in, but you don't have to do any of these experiments. I'm not allowed to bring consent forms to talks anymore after the electric shock problem um, last time. So what I need you to do, if you're willing to participate, is very quickly partner up with somebody that's sitting next to you. Partner up into pairs of two, well, of course pairs of two, partner up into pairs, and make sure the only caveat is I'm legally required to tell you that you're not allowed to partner up with somebody that you're married to or that you want to be married to, so you might need to move around. <laughs> so partner up very quickly in the pairs of two. All right, does, does everyone have a partner of non-marriageable material? Okay, the person sitting closest to me in the pair, your person number one in the group. The person sitting closest to me, your person number one. The person further, some of you were like, I already knew I was person number one in this pair. <laughs> the other person, your person number two. There's a one and a two in each group. Raise your hand if you're number one. Raise your hand if you're number two. That is not the experiment, but I have to do that. I have to do that now because I did this experiment on Wall Street with a struggling bank and it literally took them five minutes to figure out who number one in the group was, <laughs> which explains something. So here's what I need you to do. Raise your hand if you have a psychology background. Fantastic, Chloe. Um, for my psychology friends, this is my emotional prime. 
Over the course of your life, you've taken your genetic predispositions, what you were born with, and you've built those genes up with your self-discipline and your self-control. So you could pass the classes you needed to in school, to get into the schools you wanted to, to apply yourselves to your jobs and to this movement. I'd like you to take all of the self-discipline and control that you've been cultivating for decades, and I'd like you to use it to control your behavior for just seven seconds of this experiment, if you can. At eight seconds, you can do whatever you like with your partner. So here's what I'd like you to do. Person number one, what we ask you to do in this experiment is to not get angry with person number two when they do to you what I'm about to tell them to do to you. <laughs> Person number one, don't get angry, don't get sad. Please, please don't cry like the group last week. What I'd like you to do <laughs> is to do absolutely nothing. So person number one and two, please make sure you're facing one another. If you can, try and be within striking distance of person number two. <laughs> and person number one, go neutral on the inside. Try and feel no emotions and try and think no thoughts, which for some of you will be much easier than for others. <laughs> then what I'd like you to do is to control your face. I don't want to see any fear or frustration or flinching on your face. Basically, person number one, show a poker face to person number two. Once you're ready, then person number two, please look at them. Make sure you're looking at them deeply in the eyes. And while they use their decades of self-discipline and control to control their face, please, number two, just smile genuinely at person number one. <laughs> Get, go. <laughs> <laughs> and stop. I'm sorry, we're going to have to do that experiment one more time. <laughs> I didn't realize when I paired you up that person number one was going to be that inept at it. <laughs> person number two, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you were the one with all the power and control in this relationship. So let's just switch this around. Now, my psychology friends, you know we can't do this. They've already seen the experiment. Let's try it. Person number two, go neutral on the inside. Use your decades of self-discipline and control to just control your face for seven seconds. Person number one, please look at them. And for the next seven seconds, it's your turn for retaliation. Please smile genuinely. And stop. So raise your hand. Raise your hand if smiling in this experiment means failure. Not smiling means success. Raise your hand if you failed miserably at this experiment. Raise them high and proud. That is extraordinarily terrible as well. <laughs> I wish we had time to test this, but we don't here today, so let me tell you what the, the results almost always are, and it looks like that case for this room, which I'm not surprised about. 80 to 85% of people worldwide cannot control themselves for the seven seconds of this experiment. I did this experiment with senior level bankers, all men, all in their mid-50s in Tokyo, Japan. Smile percentage, 81%. What we're finding is this is extraordinarily uni universal, and it's universal for a reason that I think is the science behind the movement you're trying to create. As many of you know that there's something inside the human brain that we've just discovered within the past decade which changes what it means to be human, and we never get research like that. What we found is that inside the human brain, if I, well, if I put myself into a brain scan and I start to smile, part of my brain lights up showing activation, basically saying, Sean, you're smiling. That's not that interesting. But what we find is that if I'm in that same brain scan and I'm not smiling, which is what you just attempted to do and failed at miserably, but the technician smiles at me, for some reason, small little parts of my brain called mirror neurons, as many of you know, mirror neurons start to light up showing activation. When these mirror neurons light up, they basically tell my brain, Sean, you're smiling. But I'm not smiling. You're smiling. But before I can stop myself, my brain drops a chemical called dopamine into my system, raising my levels of happiness and enjoyment, and my motor neurons cause my face to contort into a smile before I can stop myself. You've seen this happen before. If you've been speaking to a group of people and one person starts to yawn and then other people start to yawn, that's not because you're boring. That can't possibly be it. 
what's happening there is their brains, when you see somebody in your visual field experience something, it changes your brain to make you feel like you are the one who's actually experiencing it. I was watching a Patriots football game in a bar up in Boston. It was an away game. And one of our receivers got flipped over and landed on his helmet. And his neck moved in this way it shouldn't if he has bones in his neck. And every time they showed the replay, you've seen this happen before, everyone at the bar groaned. Everyone went, oh, immediately. I looked around the bar, and there were two guys holding their necks while they're watching the replay. I'm like, you guys didn't get hit. We're sitting hundreds of miles from the guy who actually got hit. Neither of you guys played football. Actually, neither of you guys played anything. But you're acting as if you got hit hard by a linebacker. The reason was, as they were seeing something on the television, their brain was experiencing it as if they were the one that was getting hit. What's more amazing is if you have 15 strangers all waiting for a plane, they don't even know they're part of an experiment yet, and you introduce a research confederate as somebody who works on my team, no one else knows as a researcher. The confederate stands in the middle of the 15 people and just begins to bounce nervously in place, tap his foot impatiently on the ground, and look at his watch repeatedly with a frown on his face. Within two minutes of waiting for that plane or train, depending on the study worldwide, on average, seven to 12 of the 15 individuals one consciously either start bouncing nervously in place and or tapping their foot and or looking at their watch more than four times in a two minute span of time. If you don't believe me, this is actually one of the experiments you can try out yourself the next time you're getting on a plane if you want to spread stress and negativity to other people. <laughs> but what we're finding is that these mirror neurons are extraordinary because of course we know we're hardwired with, for sympathy oh, I see that you're experiencing or suffering with something, I have sympathy for you, right? Or somebody is stressed or anxious about things that are going on in the, the world markets or in their own personal life, well, that person's stressed or anxious. That's sympathy and that's boring for researchers. We knew you could do that. The discovery of the mirror neuron changes everything about connection because it means as you look around at this room, it's easy to think everyone in this room is an individual, and I can study each of you separately. Each of you has different personality traits. Each of you has different skill sets and IQs. I don't see any wires connecting your brain, and you're certainly not connected at any organic material level. So clearly, everyone has their own separate brains. That's how we've been studying you for the entirety of science, and the problem is we were extraordinarily wrong. We were looking for wires where there were none. Turns out, because of these mirror neurons inside the human brain, which connect us and hardwire us not just for sympathy, but for empathy, what this means is all of our brains are wirelessly connected through a mirror neuron network. Our brains are actually wirelessly connected because that means the thought that you have is actually changing your nonverbals right now. And those nonverbals are changing my thought processes up here. As a result of that, your thoughts are changing my thoughts and back and forth. This explains why we see not only smiles and yawns spread, but stress, anxiety. If you're around people that are pessimistic, you can pick up on that like secondhand smoke. But it also explains something else extraordinary. Just like you saw in some of those ads where a single thought was being translated to somebody clear across the country and changing their emotions. What we found is the very first thing that people do when they hear about these mirror neurons is they say, here's the people I'm going to buffer my brain against. I'm never going to talk to these people anymore. Here's a list of these people. Too bad I'm married to some of them, you know, right? <laughs> so as a result of that, what happens is we just shield ourselves off from connection. There's a more powerful way. The discovery of these mirror neurons empowers every single person in this room and this movement. Because what it means is a single change you make to your own life, to your levels of optimism, your gratitude, positive habits you take on, not only change your levels of happiness, it turns out it changes the levels of happiness of a stranger getting on a plane with you, or somebody ordering a Starbucks latte behind you, or your coworkers, your family members, and your friends. So today what I'd like to talk about is how do we change the lens through which we view the world to raise our levels of happiness, and how do we create a successful movement to not only help the world become more positive, but to help the MS Society as well. In order to do that, I'd like to tell you about the research I was doing at Harvard. I applied to Harvard, just so you know, on a dare. I grew up in a small town in Waco, Texas. Um, well, I was at Woodway, so it's even a suburb of Waco. Um, <laughs> uh, I loved Waco. I know people have heard of Waco, um, unfortunately, for the wrong reasons. But I loved Waco. I'm actually going there right after this talk to go see my parents and to, for Baylor homecoming, so I'm really excited. But 
I was going to live my whole life in Waco. I applied to Harvard just on a dare. My family had no money for college, so my choices were Baylor, which would be free, or the Naval Academy, which would be free. When I got in, accepted to Harvard, and then two weeks later got a Navy scholarship, which paid for the whole thing, suddenly something that wasn't even a possibility became a reality. Now, the reason I mention that to you is it changed the way that we looked at the happiness research I'm about to talk about. I'm going to talk about happiness at Harvard for about three minutes, but it has nothing to do with Harvard. It has to do with how the human brain works as it processes what is success and how does it connect to happiness. See, when I got into Harvard, I felt so happy. I felt like it was a privilege because it was something I never expected to have. So if I found myself in a classroom full of students that might have been much better prepared than I was or much smarter than me, I could have felt bad about myself. But instead, my brain decided to say, I feel privileged just to get to be in a room full of all these smart people. I looked around, and there were many students that saw their experience like this. They got involved with activities that were outside of their comfort zone or took classes they might get a B in or a C in just because they wanted to learn, not because they were caring about how they compared to other people. Those were the students that got embedded within the social fabric that increased those levels of connection and ended up loving their Harvard experience. And they're the ones that give the most in donations afterwards back to the school, which is why Harvard got interested in this research in the first place. But afterwards, I then spent the next eight years of my life teaching and researching in Cambridge at, Har at Harvard. So I decided to live in the dorms with the freshmen. Harvard invited me to. I wasn't, I wasn't that guy <laughs> um, <laughs> for most of it. So for about eight years of my life, I lived with the freshmen in the dorms after graduating, which meant I got to see the transition from high school to college. And here's what I found. No matter how happy these students were with one success, getting into the school, Two weeks later, their brain was focused not on the privilege of being there, nor even on their philosophy or their physics. Their brain's bandwidth was actually being taken up by now all the workload, the competition, the stresses, the hassles, and complaints. Four out of five Harvard students exp report experiencing work debilitating depression, which is amazing. This is their freshman dining hall. When my friends from Waco come to, to see this, they say it looks like something out of Hogwarts from the movie Harry Potter which it does. How many people have seen Harry Potter? This is Hogwarts from the movie Harry Potter, <laughs> and that's Harvard. And when they see this, they say, this is the fantastical version of what life could be like, right? The school looks like Hogwarts. So Sean, why are you not off in impoverished schools in Africa studying happiness? Or why aren't you in um, a, a cancer ward in a Boston Children's Hospital. Why aren't you in those places? And since, I've been to all those places. But their question was, they say, why would you waste time studying happiness at Harvard? Seriously, what does a Harvard student possibly have to be unhappy about? Embedded within that question is the key to understanding the science of happiness for this community and for the world at large. Because what that question assumes is that your external world has to predict your happiness. That if you find yourself in a beautiful building, if you find yourself in uh, the, the slums in India, if you find yourself extraordinarily healthy, or if you find yourself not being as healthy as you wish you were, what we find is that those externals, in fact, if I have all of your externals, if I have where you live in the world, how much money you make, what the weather is like, whether or not you're married or not, whether or not you have children or not, all of these things combined, I can predict only 10% of your long-term happiness. That's a problem for researchers because I'm, <laughs> I want to be able to predict happiness. But 90% of your happiness is a mystery to scientists if all I have is what's going on in your world. Because it's not about the external reality that shapes our long-term happiness. It's how your brain processes the reality you find yourself in, which is why we find extraordinarily happy children living in the slums of India or an impoverished school in Africa or in the United States. And why we find students at Harvard or CEOs or bankers that make multiple millions every year and are extraordinarily unhappy. With the Harvard students, the last uh, story I'll tell you about them is I did a study of 1,600 students looking at what causes people to feel happiness in a competitive environment. And imagine a student who ever since they were one year old might have been placed into a crib wearing a onesie that says bound for, bound for Harvard and a cute little Yale hat in case something terrible happened. 
And ever since they were in special pre-pre-pre-K school that they got into four years before they were conceived, they were at the top 1% of their class. Junior high, high school, standardized test, top 1%, walk into the freshman dining hall and have a terrible realization. 50% of them are now below average. As I put it more poignantly to the students, it seems based upon my research that 99% of Harvard students do not graduate in the top 1%, <laughs> which they don't find funny either. <laughs> but what's amazing is if being in the top 1% is what can make you happy, then 99% are consigned to unhappiness. And when we research the top 1%, it turns out they're actually slightly less happy than the 99%. So no one's happy. That formula is broken. What I'd like to talk about is a formula change that I think can empower our own levels of happiness that can help create the positive connection we want to be able to make with other people and keep us moving forward and resilient. This slide looks boring, um, uh, but embedded within it is a revolution. How many of you in this room have children? Oh, lots of you. I don't have children yet. I can't wait. So I have more people to experiment on. <laughs> One of the things we found is if I know your children's IQ scores, I can only predict a third of their grades in school. That's one of those boring statistics you read about sometimes in CNN, but that's actually a fantastic uh, statistic if you think about it. Because when I was in school, if a kid got all A's, I thought, that kid is smart. Kid gets C's and D's, that kid is not smart. End of the story, we don't have to talk about anything. I've already parsed the world. Smart kids, not smart kids, done. Scientifically, that's completely inaccurate. Two-thirds, the majority of grades have zero correlation with, with, uh, with your intelligence. They have to do with three other, three other predictors. The first is the belief that your behavior matters. If a child believes that their behavior matters, they study because they think it's going to have an effect. They keep throwing the spiral on the football field. They apply to colleges. They apply for those scholarships because they believe that their behavior matters. The second predictor of long-term success is your social support network, which is embedded within the connections you feel with other people. Take children with equal intelligence, but give one of them a positive social support network, and their achievement scores skyrocket. The third is every child I've worked with experiences stress. But some view, children view stress as a challenge which turns on the human brain to its highest capability. And some view it as a threat which causes us to go into fight or flight against stress, which is a fight or flight response. What we find is those same, those same predictors get magnified the longer we live. For everyone in this room, what we find is your success with this movement, with your organizations, with your businesses, with your medical practices, what we find is cross-industry if I know your intelligence, I can predict only 25% of your job success over a five-year period. 75% of the success of what you do, 75% of it has nothing to do with intelligence. And that's true for even the technology fields, financials, for doctors, the medical community. 75% of it has to be, is predicted by three other factors. The belief that your behavior matters and how you teach other people to do that as well. Your social support networks at home and at work. And the third is everyone experiences stress, but if you view stress as a challenge instead of as a threat, what we find is your achievement score is skyrocket. Now I gave that information to, a, to probably the most elite boarding school in New England, and they said, Sean, we already know this. We push people so hard to be successful, we find that it's breaking them down sometimes. So once a year, we spend a ton of money having a wellness week. And we fly in people from all over the globe. Monday night, we're so excited. We have the world's leading expert flying in from India to talk about adolescent depression. And Tuesday night, we have somebody coming in and talking about uh, illicit drug use. Wednesday night is eating disorders. Thursday night, we're doing school violence and team bullying. And then Friday night, we're trying to decide between risky sex or happiness. I said, actually, what I said was, uh, that's a lot of people's Friday nights. <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> and I was the only person on the phone laughing. <laughs> there were seven, the entire school board was on the phone. It was silence for like four seconds, which is a long time. So I said, into the silence, I said, I'd be honored to speak at your school, but just so you know, that's not a wellness week. That's a sickness week. What you've done there is you've outlined and emphasized all the negative things that could befall a person. But even the elimination of disease even the absence of disease is not health. Health is what happens on the positive side of the curve. 
It's what human potential actually is. And if you want to see what human potential is, we need to get the brain to be working at its highest possible levels, which means impacting the belief that your behavior matters, your social support network, your connections, and your ability to see stress as a challenge instead of as a threat. The reason for that is the Happiness Advantage research, and I'm so excited that each of you have the Happiness Advantage book in front of you, because this will allow you to go into much greater detail than we were going to be able to talk about today, and go through seven strategies that we've researched can raise levels of happiness and help us to ripple it out. I'd like to talk about just one of them, but I want to tell you what the Happiness Advantage is. What we found is four-year-old children split into two different groups. If you prime one of the groups of children to be positive, those children put blocks together up to 50% faster and more accurately than the children at neutral, which is surprising because happiness should have zero correlation with spatial memory. But then they found in 1997 that if you prime medical students as they're reading through patient histories to come up with the correct diagnosis before going on to the next uh, patient history, what they found is they primed those third-year medical students to be positive, negative, neutral, or stressed. And what they found is that the third-year students at positive were up to 19% faster and more accurate at coming up with the correct diagnosis. This study has actually been replicated once these people have actually gotten out into the medical community, and the likelihood of the person actually following up with their, the treatments that they have is being predicted by the positivity of the doctors in the office. What's amazing about that is we oftentimes are so focused upon other people's happiness, we miss out on how important our own happiness is. For things that are as complex as medical diagnoses, but even our intelligence, we found if I prime you to be positive before taking intelligence tests, 10 of them, what we find is you do better in not one or two dimensions of intelligence, but all of them. Now, when I first heard that, I said, that's ridiculous, right? How, how would happiness make you smarter? Because let's be honest, the happy people aren't always the smartest people in the room. So that result can't be the case. And let's be honest even more, happy people are not the smart people. Happy people are the ones who don't get it. <laughs> happy people are the ones I'm going to have to keep explaining things to over and over again. They don't understand what's going on uh, in their bodies. They don't understand what's going on in the world. And they certainly don't understand how unhappy their happiness all the time makes me feel. <laughs> But that's not what this research was saying. It's more powerful. It was not saying that if you're happy, you're the smartest person in the world. What it's saying is, everyone in this room, you know somebody who's brilliant and not happy. And everyone in this room, you know someone who's successful and not happy. You see that and you say, well, if we want to create a successful movement, if we want to be successful at our medical research, then let's focus on those things. Happiness has no correlation. That's only part of the story. The other part of the story is everyone in here has a band of potential. Now, let's say for intelligence, some people's band is so high that even when they're at the bottom of their potential, they're way above average and they seem brilliant. But here's what we found. Raise somebody's levels of happiness and not only does their intelligence rise, but so do their success rates. If that's the case, what we've discovered is something extraordinarily powerful. When your brain is positive, you rise to the top part of your potential. And as a result of that, we can improve your, not only your intelligence, but we can actually improve every single success outcome that we're looking for. Part of the reason for that is the front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, is the part of the brain that makes good decisions. That's the part of your brain you want working. It sees possibilities about how to make changes in the world. But as soon as you become threatened, that picture on the right has the amygdala, or what I call in the book the jerk activating. And the jerk literally steals resources from the thinker. So the more angry and frustrated and negative and stressed we feel, the more we see the world as threatening, the less our brain is able to think about how do we solve these problems. But if we can raise our levels of positivity in the midst of it, what we find is that every business outcome arises. Every educational outcome rises. Health improves. What we find is we have less burnout, less turnover. People have 37% higher, higher levels of sales at positive. They're 31% more productive. All the things that fuel a movement like this one. The question is, how do we reach that type of happiness? If you take away one thing from my talk today, I hope it's this. Most individuals in the world are short-circuiting their potential because they're following a formula for happiness and success which is scientifically backwards. Most of us think, if I can work harder right now, then we can be successful and achieve all the goals we've set for the society. And once we achieve those goals, then we're going to feel happy. 
That undergirds most of our managing styles, most of our parenting style, most of the ways we think about human progress. The problem is that's not how our brains work for two reasons. Every time your brain has a success, your brain changes the goalpost of what success looks like. Get into a good school, don't get excited. Now you have to get better grades so you can get into a better school, so you can get that job, so you can rise up in the ranks. As soon as you have a job, that doesn't make you happy forever because now you need a promotion. Now you need to hit that sales target. Hit the sales target, we're going to move it, right? And hit your donation targets, we're going to raise those as well. And if happiness is linked to those, what we find is every time you have a success, it's a moving target. And if happiness is on the opposite side of that, what we've done as a society is we've pushed happiness over the cognitive horizon. We'll never get there. And if it, we do, it's fleeting. And more importantly than that, and the reason I'm here today is that if you change the formula, if you raise the levels of happiness and positivity in the present, in the midst of the challenge, as you're struggling to look for treatments and for cures and for connection, what we find is in the midst of that, the more positive you are, it raises every single success rate afterwards. In other words, happiness and positivity is a precursor to greater success and health, not just the result of it. Think about how much we do that. As soon as I get through these 8 to 14 hours of work, then I'm going to feel happier. As soon as I lose 50 pounds, then I'm going to feel happier. As soon as I run the marathon or as soon as I do, um, as soon as I uh, get a promotion or hit these targets, then I'll feel happier. If we can change the formula, we have extraordinary amounts of potential in our brains we haven't even tapped into. In order to tap into those, I'd like to talk about Tetris. How many people have played the video game Tetris? A lot of you. It's okay if you haven't played the game Tetris, you're more productive than the people who raise their hands. <laughs> Tetris is a video game where shapes fall from the ceiling like they do in real life, and you just rotate them around, and all you're supposed to do is make straight lines. The goal of Tetris is make as many straight lines as possible. What we found is Harvard Medical School hired Harvard Business School students and paid them to play Tetris for five hours in a row while sitting in a brain scan. At the end of the experiment, three weeks later, one of the participants was walking through Harvard Yard, saw the professor, and she went up to him. She said, hi, professor. He said, I have no idea who you are. And she said, I did your Tetris experiment. And he said, thank you, and walked away. And she grabbed this old professor and turned him back around. And she said, professor, I need to tell you something. You're going to think I'm crazy, but after that experiment, where I'd sit in the basement of that laboratory making straight lines. Afterwards, I met up with one of my friends in Harvard Yard. We walked into a supermarket, and she found me rearranging the bread on the shelf to make straight lines. She said, am I crazy? And he said, yes, yes, you are. <laughs> Please stop touching me. But it, uh, it turns out when we started researching people like that, it turns out many of the participants, actually it turns out she was crazy, but there was another participant who, was, who yelled out in class, I wish I had an L-shaped car so I can make a straight line down this road, which doesn't make any sense. We don't even make L-shaped cars anymore. But her brain was focused on, how do I make straight lines out of my environment? She was stuck with one pattern of seeing the world. For many of the people you work with, for your loved ones, even ourselves, oftentimes we get stuck in a mental pattern. And the very first step to being able to raise our levels of optimism in the midst of a challenge is to change the pattern through which we view the world and to help other people to do it as well, to raise the belief that our behavior matters and to connect through those social support networks. In order to do that, I was researching at KPMG, a large accounting firm, working with their tax auditors, trying to make tax auditors happier. And one of the things we found is that many of these auditors were spending 8 to 14 hours a day reading through tax forms looking for mistakes and errors, which made them great at their job. But what we found is that many of them were actually experiencing high levels of depression. We, spent, we did a training with them for three hours, teaching them about positive psychology and teaching them these principles in the book. And we were testing them over time. What we're interested in is long-term changes and how people's levels of happiness work. And what we found, and it was just published in the Harvard Business Review, is that if you give somebody an introduction to positive psychology and get them to create a positive habit, up to four months later, their levels of life satisfaction remain elevated. It's not just a short-term boost, which we oftentimes feel sometimes if you have a motivational speaker. You're like, wow, my life has totally changed. And then you get that first email and you go right back to being who you were. What I want is long-term quantifiable positive change. And we just found that you can do that. But more importantly, what happened was in the control group. One of the individuals there said, Sean, I've been so depressed over the past three years, I'm getting about 20% less work done. 
I said, why are you so depressed? And he said, I don't know. I said, what are you doing to fix it? And he said, I don't know. Well, one thing I tried was at, at lunch one time, I took a break and I made an Excel spreadsheet. And his eyes lit up when he said spreadsheet. And I said, uh, and he said, I wrote down a list of all the mistakes I felt like my wife had been making in our relationship over the past six months so that we could work on it together. And I was so excited. I printed the spreadsheet out, brought the spreadsheet home to my wife, handed it to my, to my ex-wife, and handed this to her. And I'm listening to this guy tell a story, and he's so clearly stuck in the Tetris effect, or what we call a cognitive afterimage. What had happened was he had trained his brain to look for the mistakes, errors, flaws first. Once he became a tax audit manager, that's all he saw on his team. All he saw were the flaws and mistakes and problems first, with no brain left over for actually praising and encouraging and recognizing the people on his team. And he was treating his wife like a tax form. What we know is there are negative Tetris effects we can get involved with. And if you have loved ones, you probably experienced these types of things yourselves. I'm not interested in those. If the brain can be imprinted with a negative pattern, it can equally be imprinted with a positive pattern that causes us in this room to be more adaptive and raise our potential. We found five of those that I'm going to mention just briefly, but are in principle one in the book. And what I'd love for everyone to do is if we really want to create connection, if we really want to raise our levels of happiness and see what our potential actually is, we need to start with a behavioral change. That behavioral change, I'm going to suggest five of them. We found five habits that have done for 21 days in a row can actually significantly raise our levels of optimism for the long run, not just for the short run, and help us to reap the happiness advantage as we try to achieve the auspicious goals you've set for yourselves. The first one is very simple, and it's the one I hope most of you do. What we had people do is for 21 days in a row, which by the way, William James, who is the professor at Harvard after whom our psychology building is named, said you do the same habit 21 days in a row, day 22, you don't even have to think about it. Put on a seatbelt 21 days in a row, day 22, boom, it's on. It's why we brush our teeth, because we brush our teeth every day, but we don't floss all the time, right? So then it's a very difficult challenge. Here's what we found. 21 days in a row, you wake up every morning, and on a blank sheet of paper or out loud to somebody, you write or say three new things you're grateful for that have occurred over the past 24 hours. Extraordinarily simple, and that's, by the way, why we started here. Three things you're grateful for that are new that happened over the past 24 hours. You can never repeat them, and you have to be specific. You can't say, I'm grateful for my children. You have to say why you're grateful for your children. That's new over the past 24 hours. Sounds small. Everyone in this room, I guarantee, thinks that they're already a grateful person. But very rarely do we consciously train our brains to scan the world for more things we're grateful for in a present moment. What we find is when you do this, I was out working at, with Adobe with some of their senior leaders, and I had spoken to them six months previously. And when I came back, one of the senior leaders came up to me, and she just started scrolling through her phone. And I didn't know who she was and what she was doing. And it was actually, it went on for forever. Was, I was like, this is awkward. Um, <laughs> but then at the end of it, she said, that is six months worth of three gratitudes every morning. And every time that I have something that makes me feel sick, or I get an email that makes me feel negative, or the stock price drops, as soon as that happens, I just start scrolling. Because what happens is my brain can't justify being as stressed and unhappy in light of all these extraordinary things that make me grateful. That's not even why we do the experiment, but that's now exactly what I do myself. But what we found is 21 days of doing this, by day 22, you test individuals who had tested pessimists their entire life. They might be in their 50s or 60s, training their genes that they might have been born with that might have been pessimistic in the first place for 50 years for pessimism. And what we find is 21 days later, now over the course of the whole 24 hours, they test as more optimistic, low-level optimists. That's great, stopped the experiment six months later, came back in, tested them. They're now testing as low to moderate-level optimists. Optimism is learned. Yes, you have genetic predispositions, but you can raise your level of optimism doing something as extraordinarily simple as this. And you can do this with your spouse, if you do three things you're grateful for every night out loud with your spouse, what we find is that not only does it strengthen your relationship and your optimism levels six months later are significantly elevated, but you actually find your spouse to be significantly more attractive six months later than they were six months previous, which scientifically we never get that result, <laughs> right? That somebody ages six months and now they're more attractive. But what's happening is you're viewing them through a different lens. It's not a lens of flaws and blemishes. It's a lens that sees all the things you're grateful for about that person. 
We've had people start this. One of the bankers I worked with started this over uh, dinner with her family. And she said on the day that the US stock market dropped 600 points, she had the worst working day of her life because of a mistake she had made on that day. Over and over again, her brain was replaying that mistake. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? She came home that night on a neural track of self-loathing. Midway through her, the dinner, her five-year-old daughter said, Mom, you didn't say your gratitudes tonight. And the mom had to pick herself up off of a neural track of self-loathing, scan the world for any three things she was grateful for on the worst working day of her life before what she thought would be going back. But she didn't. She went back to this middle zone where she started actually asking her family about their day. And when she went back to work that night to start fixing the problem, she pro saw the problem as not permanent and pervasive, but it was local. It's one part of reality and it was temporary. What we want is rational optimism. I talked to somebody after one of my talks and we went in, the, uh, in a car to the airport together and he didn't put on a seatbelt and I couldn't find mine. And I said, you don't wear seatbelts? He said, no, Sean, I listened to your talk. I'm an optimist now. <laughs> I said, no, you're an idiot because part of what we're finding is optimism's great for a lot of things. It doesn't stop reality from affecting us. It doesn't stop cars from hitting you. But that's irrational optimism. And that's what gives optimism and happiness a bad name. Because some people put on rose-colored glasses and don't see any of the problems in the world. And that's not what we're going for here. Oftentimes people tell me, hey, Sean, I'm not an optimist or a pessimist, I'm a realist. That's a nonsensical statement and you should tell them that. Because optimists and pessimists can both be realists. They can both realistically assess the problems we need to solve. A pessimist believes this problem is permanent and pervasive. And an optimist believes that problem is local and temporary. A rational optimist puts on a seatbelt. An irrational optimist doesn't put it on because they don't think they're going to get hit by a car. And a pessimist doesn't think it matters anyway because they're going to die anyway in that car accident. Well, we're looking for a rational optimist. And that is exactly how you create it. The second one is um, journaling. If you're not doing journaling right now, this is one of the most powerful ones we found. And it's not normal journaling. It's not buying a diary with a little locket on the front of it and start writing about your feelings about twilight and unicorns. It's not about that. What we have people do is over the pa think over the past 24 hours for one meaningful experience you have, and you write down every detail you can remember about that meaningful experience for just two minutes for 21 days in a row. What you're trying to do is get your brain to relive that meaningful experience. And the reason that's so important is what we found is, as soon as you do that, you identify a meaningful moment and you double it. Because your brain has trouble noticing the, connection, the difference between visualization and actual experience. So not only did you double the most meaningful experience, but over a period of 21 days, you'll create a trajectory of meaning. 21 days from now, if you start this today, your brain will actually connect your emails, the commutes, the meetings you have to the meaning embedded within your life. And instead of waking up every morning with, here are the tasks I have, check off all the tasks, go to sleep at night frustrated, I didn't get to all the tasks, and import it to the next day, what we find is if you do that, your levels of meaning start to drop significantly. What we found is if you start to do this for just 21 days in a row, we find that you change from a Tetris system, a Tetris effect of not task-based, but of meaning-based. You start to see and feel connections and meaning in your life. The third one is exercise. Everyone knows exercise is supposed to be valuable. You guys are supposed to go on mud runs, and you're supposed to go biking, and all of that's great, and it connects people, and we know that that's good, and you already heard that exercise releases these neurochemicals like endorphins which make you happier. That's not the reason happiness works in the long run. The reason it works in the long run is it teaches your brain that your, that your behavior matters. What we find is when some people exercise, they suddenly start eating healthier sometimes. Or we find that when people exercise in the morning, they're better at dealing with their inbox at 2 o'clock in the middle of the day. The reason for that is their brains are recognizing a connection between my behavior matters in this domain, I bet it matters in a whole bunch of domains. Which means exercise might be key to the MS Society movement. Not only because it connects people for fundraising, but it teaches each of the members involved that their behavior matters. And as a result of that, that spreads out creating what we call a cascade of success. Babiak found that exercise of 10 minutes a day cardio was the equivalent of taking an antidepressant. But for the next two years afterwards, it had a 30% drop in the relapse rates that people could experience. The reason for that is you create a whole 
constellation of positive habits that help us remain resilient. When we feel what we saw on some of those advertisements for someone with MS who might feel that their behavior doesn't matter anymore after they lost a girlfriend or they lost a job. Exercise is key. Fourth one is meditation. This doesn't have to be Christian or Buddhist, which is what I studied at the Divinity School. This is purely attention training, and you can do it anywhere, sitting anywhere, in anywhere of the world. All you have to do is for two minutes a day, watch your breath go in and out. That's it. That's what we were doing at Adobe as well with some of their senior leaders. Watch your breath go in and out. What it does is it undoes the negative effects of a Tetris system of multitasking, which is what we do all the time. Even if you're amazing at multitasking, your success rates drop on both of the tasks and your stress level rises. Meditation helps calm that down, activates the parasympathetic nervous system, and causes you to feel greater levels of happiness. The last one is conscious acts of kindness. This is my favorite and the most powerful based upon the research out of the five in these forms. What we find is that you have somebody wake up each morning and the first time they're at an email or they're next to a phone, they can do a two minute phone call or two minute email praising or thanking someone in their social support network. What we find is when somebody does that, 21 days later, not only does their brain recognize that they have 21 people in their social support network, which is an extraordinary, extraordinarily robust social support network. And these, by the way, could be your old coaches, old teachers, peers, volunteers, whoever it is you wanted to thank for just two minutes a day. What we find is social support is the greatest predictor of happiness and success during a time of challenge. I've said a lot of statistics today, but this melds in exactly with the idea that connection kills MS. The greatest predictor of happiness and success during a time of challenge is your social support network, which is the very first thing that many of us abandon. When we get stressed, when we get busy, my Harvard students during exams will sit in the library for 18 hours a day. They'll come out bleary-eyed, sick, depressed, they hate Harvard, and their grades are dropping. And they'll say, why? What's going on? What went on is you just divorced yourself from the greatest predictors of happiness and success. Now, I gave that list of five things to a private equity firm, and somebody in the middle of the room stood up. They were all gunners. They're top performers. And he said, Sean, I know you're from Harvard and everything, but isn't this a huge waste of our time? I said, why? And he said, huge waste of our time? All of this was common sense. What, you had to go to Harvard to realize gratitude was good for you? Good job, buddy. And he sat back down. And he's right. We will never, ever discover anything that new that creates happiness. We've heard all of it from every major religious tradition, every ancient Greek philosopher, every self-help guru up to the present. What we found, though, and what I'm researching is what happens afterwards. But after that talk, the senior manager came up to me and he said, Sean, can I speak to you for a minute? Do you remember the guy who stood up? And I was like, yes, I remember him. And he said, I was shocked to hear that guy say that because everyone in this room knows that's the most unhappy person we have working here. <laughs> he walks into the room, it's like a rain cloud, follows this guy everywhere he goes. He is the smartest analyst I've ever hired, and I don't know what to do with him because he's toxic. As soon as I put him on a team or with a new client, invariably the entire performance of that team drops. What he's pointing out to all of us is that common sense is not common action at all which part of the reason I'm here. This room knows about the role of positivity, but common sense is not common action, and especially important with the work that you do, information alone does not cause transformation. I heard a, uh, a doctor get up before me at one of the conferences and said, if you sleep eight to nine hours a night, you age significantly slower. I went up to him afterwards, and I was like, that's amazing research. You probably sleep 20 hours a night so you can live forever, which is what I would do. And he said, Sean, I'm a sleep researcher. I stay awake all night watching people sleep. <laughs> he told me he slept three hours a night. He told me how old he was, and we joked about it for a few minutes. He looked 10 years older than he actually was. He was walking, living proof of his research, but in the opposite direction. Information alone does not cause transformation. So for the last three minutes, what I'd like to do is to tell you, how do we take the things we know we want to do and make them come to life? How do we bring this research to life? Before we do that, what I'd like you to do, can we put that slide back up for just a second? I'd love for everyone in this room that's so committed to this movement and that's so committed to a positive world to commit to one positive habit you try out for 21 days in a row that you're not currently doing. What I'd love for you to do is for 21 days in a row, this community holds each other accountable to trying out a new habit to raise our levels of happiness. 
We know scientifically that these work if only you do them. So raise your hand if you're going to try out the gratitudes for the next, by the way, only try one, only adopt one at a time. Uh, how many people are going to try gratitudes for the next five day, uh, 21 days in a row? Look around and hold these people accountable. This one has the highest adoption rate. How many people are going to journal? Writing for two minutes a day about a meaningful experience. It's so powerful. The third one, who's going to do exercise? Fantastic. Who's going to do meditation? Who already does meditation? I'm so happy to see that. And uh, who's going to write the, the kind email for 21 days in a row to a new person in their social support network? Look around at this group. If you don't get an email from them, you're not in the top 21. <laughs> so let me tell you this last slide, and then I'll, um, I'll be finished. If you, I found if you give me a business card with a long email address on it, I'm significantly less likely to email you, which is ridiculous, because I want to email everyone in here. But every time I was just working with Morgan Stanley Smith Barney .com, I was like, I'm emailing none of you. <laughs> what we found is if I look at that business card, I'm like, I'm, I'm not, should I email this person now? And my brain says, no, it takes forever to email this person. Why don't we do something else? And I never email you. Similarly, I wanted to play the guitar. I had a guitar sitting in a case in my closet. William James says it takes 21 days to create a habit. I said, great, 21 days from now, I'm going to be a musician. So I made an Excel spreadsheet, of course and put 21 columns, and checked off each day playing five minutes of guitar a day, which is following the Zorro Circle, which is one of the chapters in the book there. What we did, what I did then is 21 days later, looked back at it and found I had played two days out of 21, which made me depressed because I study positive habits all the time. Then I felt depressed that I felt depressed because I study happiness all the time. So it was causing this whole downward cycle. So what I did was I took a stopwatch and timed how long it took me to get the guitar out of the case and the case out of the closet. 20 seconds. I then bought a $2 used guitar stand, put the case out of the closet, took the guitar out of the case, and put it on the stand. 21 days later, I played 21 days in a row, and William James was right. I now have a life habit of playing the guitar. Every day I'm home in San Antonio, Texas, I play the guitar. And every day that I'm traveling for work, I miss it. That's not the point of the story. That would be a very boring and self-involved story of Sean learns to play the guitar. The important part about that story is I had an illusory $2 and 20 second mental barrier to doing something I really wanted to do. I really wanted to play the guitar. But every time I walked past the closet, I said, you want to play the guitar? I know it would decrease my stress. I thought it would be an expression of my musical soul. I thought it would be great if I ever went on a date. But every time I walked past the closet, my brain said, it takes forever to get the guitar out of the case and closet. Why don't we do something else, and we'll get back to this. So I'd never play. What I was experiencing is what all of us experience as we try to move from information to transformation. When we try to create that positive habit that everyone in the room just committed to doing for 21 days in a row. And by the way, that would be extraordinary. The ripple effect outside of this room would be phenomenal, as well as the levels of happiness within this room. But what we find is, back in chemistry and physics in high school, there's a concept called activation energy. In order to catalyze a reaction, to create a change, there's this initial investment of energy, which is the highest point at the beginning of the formula. It's why we procrastinate. It's why we don't do the things we want to. What we found, though, is if you slightly increase or decrease it for an individual or for yourself, you can magnify the ability to create positive habits and to stop the ones that are debilitating us. Let me give you two quick examples. If you want to stop a negative habit that's hurting your levels of happiness, for me, my negative habit was I was watching too much TV. So the goal is to raise activation energy, the energy it takes to start it, so I could stop that. The average American, according to Google, watches 5.2 hours of television a day. That's amazing. I was slacking. I was only getting in three hours of TV, which meant that I was, wasn't seeing my friends and I wasn't getting my work done. But every day I come home from work, and like many of you, I'd sit down on the couch, exhausted, press the on button on the remote control, and I'd come home from the office and I'd watch the office. So what I did was I decided to do the same trick my brain had played upon me with the guitar on the TV. Took that stopwatch, took the batteries out of the remote control, walked them 20 seconds away, and left them in my bedroom. Next couple days, came home, sat down on the couch, pressed the on button on the remote control, usually repeatedly, and go, oh, I hate that I do these experiments. <laughs> Where did I put the batteries this time? And my brain said, Sean, we timed it. They're 20 seconds away. Let's go get them. And my brain said, no, it takes forever to go get those batteries. Why don't we do something else? So I purposely put work right beside me 
On the other side of the couch, I'd put a book that I've been wanting to read for years. I'd even told people I'd read that book on the side of the couch. <laughs> I had a journal open with a pen on it so I could immediately start writing, and I had my guitar out of the case. I didn't even have my phone so I could call my real friends and have dinner with them instead of watching my fake friends on Glee. And as a result of that, what I did was I increased my activation energy by 20 seconds and reaped back two conscious hours a day. I still watch TV, but only when it mattered, which meant lost, which means now I have nothing. <laughs> That's 14 conscious hours a week I gained back to creating a more positive world and to raise my levels of happiness and energy. If you want to create a positive habit, create a positive change, all you have to do is slightly, by around 3 to 20 seconds, make a habit easier. So for me, if I, wa I wanted to exercise in the morning, but every morning I wake up, information's definitely not transformation in the morning. Because I said, do you want to exercise? And my brain would go, <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> Where are my clothes? Where are my shoes? What part of my body am I going to exercise? And by that point, I'd fallen back asleep again. So what I did was, that was for a year and a half of failing, trying to exercise, until one night I moved my athletic shoes right next to the bed. And for 21 days in a row, and only 21 days, I just went to sleep in my gym clothes for the next morning. <laughs> My mom wonders why I'm still single. Um, <laughs> it might be these experiments, but all, the, all I had to do was roll out of bed and put my feet, which already had socks on them, right into the shoes, and I was up exercising. What I'd done is I created a path of least resistance towards a positive habit and away from the, a negative one. Try to do that with your habit. Put those gratitudes right on your desktop or right next to your nightstand. Make sure that if you have a journal, it's very accessible with a pen immediately on it, or it's right on your phone. Whatever it is you can do to make those positive changes slightly easier for you and for other people, we found four final conclusions from this. The first conclusion is that happiness is a choice. Because the brain is a, a single processor, how you decide to devote your finite resources will define what your reality is. Are you focused on the negative hassles and complaints, or are you able to get people focused on the positive? The second conclusion is how is happiness spreads. Because of the mirror neuron network, we know that your brain, when it's positive, ripples out to the people around you because we're wirelessly connected through a mirror neuron network. The third is that happiness is a work ethic. Happiness can just happen to you, but it's fleeting. But if you cultivate it, creating positive habits, you can make a long-term change. And finally, happiness is actually an advantage. Happiness is not something that will happen after the success of all the MS Society initiatives. It's what is the key to all the MS Society initiative successes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this research with you today. I hope you enjoy the book. And thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. That was uh, powerful information that, that certainly each of us can apply to our lives. And, and Sean, um, as the younger sibling uh, who still kind of walks with a limp from the injury that, that transformed me into a hybrid superhero of, of Super Bat Hulk, I, I, I definitely get that connection with you and your sister. So, <laughs> um, and, and each of you, everybody in the room, just so you know, we, we've all received a copy of Sean's book. So please take this home with you. Um, it's going to make for great reading on Travels Home. But not only um, take it home and read it, but let's all practice it and, and let's choose to, you know, choose to be happy. Um, for the rest of the day, we have a busy day ahead of us, and, and starting with our first workshop of the conference, the sessions are going to start promptly at 1025. So please check your schedule, your mobile app if you downloaded it, and make sure you get to the right session room for that. And there's something for everyone, so please take advantage and make sure that you do go to one of those workshops. We'll see everybody back here at 12 noon for lunch and a session that is packed full of MS research and an opportunity to hear from both the Society's Chief Research Officer and our new President and CEO. Thank you, and we'll see you all then. <laughs>